Humans and technology. We depend on it for our most basic needs. We take advantage of the luxuries it provides us. And as members of the human race, we like to take a kind of collective credit for its greatest achievements. Spice. It's going yeah. into space. Yeah, the combustion engine. That was pretty good. Internet, probably. The wheel. Oh, yeah, internet. that the wheel. TV, video. Phones. Uh, MP3 players. The iPod's getting smaller. Skype is an amazing invention. But most of us know very little, and more often nothing at all, about how all of this technology actually works beyond our own respective disciplines. But I don't understand much about the way iPods work. Not, not, not a lot about how the inside of the computer works, no. I had to fix my cab. I haven't got a clue. I have not a clue. Not mechanical at all. This loss of practical skill has left us very dependent on the state and the big businesses that supply our everyday infrastructure, to the extent that we are left almost completely powerless to change their behaviour. What can people really do when banks take their money and oil companies rushes towards climate disaster? They can protest. They can try not to think about it. This film is about the growing number of people who are choosing a third option. Rather than wait for the masters of their infrastructure to get their acts together, they are taking matters into their own hands and just doing it themselves. We'd like to argue that the DIY Britain that David Cameron is calling for is already here. This is Andy Pagg. We met him before he set off on his most recent expedition to drive right the way around the world without using fossil fuels. My name's Andy Pagg. Uh, in 2007, I drove a chocolate-powered lorry to Timbuktu using uh, biodiesel made from waste cocoa butter. And then uh, in 2008, I organised the Greece to Greece rally with a converted car, in fact, 10 converted cars like this one, driving from London to Athens, powered entirely by waste vegetable oil that teams had to scavenge from restaurants and burger bars along the route uh, to use as fuel to power their journey. So for about 15 years I've been running vehicle-based expeditions in the Sahara and in West Africa um, and I've always, in the back of my mind, been conscious of the fact that it's actually quite an unsustainable thing to do. So I wanted to try and do it in a more sustainable way and that's how I got involved with looking at biofuels and, and one of the cleanest and best ways of making biofuels is to use a waste product, turning something that's rubbish into fuel. So that's how the chocolate-powered lorry expedition came about, using waste cocoa butter um, to make biodiesel. Uh, and then the sort of follow-on from that, having driven from London to Timbuktu to um, with biodiesel we had to carry all the fuel with us and we wanted to see if we can possible and feasible to drive across Europe collecting a sustainable fuel as you go and the most practical way that I found of doing that was looking at waste uh, cooking oil that restaurants are throwing out and uh, converting a diesel engine vehicle to run on that fuel. I converted this car myself and I, I'm an engineer by training but I'm really not a mechanic and it, it wasn't it wasn't as hard as you might think. You have your dirty oil in a jerry can which starts off here with a tube that draws it in, it gets sucked up by this pump and this pump is a 12 volt pump so again it's taking energy from the engine and then from there it squirts it through a heat exchanger so again warming the oil up but using the energy from the engine to do that and then it gets passed through to here so this is a centrifuge and inside here the oil spins around at about 9,000 rpm and effectively it squeezes all the dirt and all the water out to the side and the clean oil comes through the middle so in one easy process, it, um, it purifies the oil. And as I said, it's taking all its energy from an engine that's running on the oil, so there's no other energy required and no emissions as a result of that involved in purifying it. The industry approach to biofuels has been to cut down vast areas of rainforest in places like Indonesia in order to plant palm oil crops, making it quite the opposite of the green alternative to petroleum we were told it would be. The catering industry in the UK alone produces between 50 and 90 million litres of waste cooking oil each year. So Andy is filling his tank with a waste byproduct that would otherwise go straight into landfill, and what's more, it's free. Like Andy, Dave Days is a self-taught DIYer who started out with no practical skills at all, but after getting involved in a council scheme in the 80s, he ended up building his own house. What the council said, here you go, there's the land, and there's the architect, which was Walter Siegel, and there's the cash. Would you fancy building your own house? So, as a council tenant, paying rent, build your own house? Yeah, I'll have some of that. The plots were already chosen. So basically, we would just said, there's your plot, get on with it. It took two and a half years with two kids when we started this in 85. Didn't finish it till 87. Every evening, every weekend, no friends, no social life, right? And always on the edge or breaking up in a relationship because it's stressful. That's why not everybody can do the DIY trip. But clearly the pros outweighed the cons because Dave's DIY journey didn't stop there. How I got into solar panels was the fact that my bills, my gas bills and my electricity bills were just ridiculous. Yeah. 
And there's 24 of those up there on that roof there. All orientated towards the south and at a 30 degree angle, which is the optimum angle so that throughout the year, that's the maximum you're gonna get. Okay, I've got the solar panels in place. I'm making sure that I have no standby equipment running or at least I've got a switch can turn off all my standbys. I'm producing my own electricity. How can I be spunking it in halogens and tungstens? And then I spoke to someone, he said, well, LEDs. So that's the electricity taken care of. And then the gas, that's the mother. Well, I dig, I had a mini dig around here and I dug a trench and there's a slit trench. And I put these panels down vertically and these panels total up at 200 meters of 40 mil high density plastic. And through that pipe, I'm running water, which has got antifreeze. So the temperature of the soil, in fact, today, I reckon it's about two degrees, even three degrees. Three degrees to the heat pump is hot. But what it does with it, it mixes it with refrigerant. Now refrigerant, if you put anything above minus 15 against refrigerant, it starts to boil. Then the compressor kicks in and starts to compress it and vaporize it. And through that action, that chemical reaction and the mechanical movement of the compressor, you generate 55 degrees centigrade. That's enough to heat my house, give me 400 litres of water, or in fact, it can give me three baths in one go. And if I use three baths in one go, which I never have, it only takes me another 35 minutes to give me a fourth bath, all right? And then there's no emissions. My solar panels are giving me enough electricity to supply enough electricity to run the heat pump. And now my next move is to insulate the house so I don't have to run it so high. The key thing what I've done is that I'm taking stuff that's on the shelf. It's not nothing new. The ground source heat pump is an 80 year old technology. I've saved over the last three years, must have been about eight or nine tons in carbon. One litre house. If, imagine you multiply by the amount of houses in the UK. We'd be self-sufficient. Why can't we do it? But Dave's ground source heat pump and Andy's veggie oil vehicle are about more than reducing their carbon footprints or saving a few quid. Through DIY, they have attained a level of independence they wouldn't have otherwise had. All too often with environmental messages, we're told you can't do that, you have to stop doing this. Uh, my hope is that we can find environmentally sustainable ways of continuing to do the things that we all love on a day-to-day -day basis. In my case, it's long-distance overland expeditions uh, and encountering new cultures and new ways of doing things around the world. I'd have to go out to work ridiculous hours to pay someone to come and do the work and they ain't going to do it how I like it. Yeah. They're not going to do it to my standard. Yeah. All right? So I take longer of my job, but I know when I finish and gone and they, my, my bones have gone to dust, what I've left here, even if this falls down, is a memory mm. and it's there. My boys will see that and their kids will see it. And that's it, you can't buy that. It made sense and it also meant that, well, this is how everybody should be doing it. Why should you be tied to a utility company? Me, this old raster, if I can do it, then you can do it. In our next film, we'll look at how this kind of independence can be crucial in the event of disaster scenarios and the collapse of basic infrastructure.